All right, this is going to be a very different presentation than you've seen in the past. <laughs> there we go. All right, how many of you have seen the bear? I have. You have? Okay, yeah. awesome. Do you like it? <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah, I think it's a great show. Um, this is going to be a very different presentation as there's not going to be much clinical stuff. But the whole point of why I'm doing these lectures for you all is kind of what I wish I had known when I was in school at this time. So one day you're not going to worry about finding MB2s. I promise that day will come. Uh, one day you're not going to worry about calcified teeth. But the thing that you all have to worry about is patients and how the experience happens. So let's go ahead and get started here. Uh, disclosure is the same as last time. I do some work with Son Endo, but I haven't seen him in a minute. And that's about it. So my birthday, 2023, May 6th, my life changed because we went here. Here are my compatriots. Uh, it's my wife on my right. It's my friend Megan. She's a local orthodontist. That's her wife, Kelsey, an endodontist in Carson City, which is about 45 minutes from me. And then the couple over on the, my left-hand side is Logan and Lizzie. Logan is a fantastic endodontist. He's better than all of us combined, and he has one hand. Don't know how he does it. Dude's absolutely incredible. And we had dinner at a very fancy restaurant. So let me set the scene for you. May the 4th, I was hanging out with these fools at the AAE. Oh. Right? I know. You guys You guys made it in a presentation. So. <laughs> so we're having a great time. And my wife actually surprised me and flew out for my birthday. And Logan, who you see here looking very suave, talking for San Endo, is a local Chicagoan and arranged for us to go to this very cool restaurant, which was actually a brewery with two Michelin stars. So it... We had crazy food there, like octopus and hamachi and, of course, a beer that was made with 115 pounds of black truffles, because, of course, it was. And I don't talk about this meal at all. It was incredible. And the reason why is the next night we went to this nondescript building, and that is where my life changed forever, and we're going to talk about why. So how on earth did this restaurant do such an amazing job? And you might be saying, well, it was probably the food. The food's delicious. A little bit of my background, these are things that I normally do, like make lobster bisque from Four Live Lobsters, or help my buddy make salami out of the deer that he shot after I helped butcher it as well. And of course, you can't uh, not include my cute little daughter. Um, the local seafood shop knows her because how many three-year-olds eat oysters um, and then take them camping? This is us camping. This is my crazy family. So you might say, okay, it must have been the alcohol. The, the wine must have been fantastic. Well, for those of you who don't know, I grew up working in the wine industry. Here's one of my cellars and here's the other. So we are used to fine dining and fine foods. And yet there's nothing that I have ever been able to make that makes my wife make faces like this throughout the entire night. So what was the difference? Well, everyone knows this quote. People I definitely forgot some of the food. I definitely forgot some of the uh, the drinks, but I will never forget how they, the experience and what they did and how it was so incredible and next level that I won't stop talking about it. <laughs> and that is how you can take a place, which should be insane. It's a brewery with two Michelin stars that makes amazing beer and all this other stuff is a backstory to this little place right here. And this is actually where we sat. So we were in the kitchen table. It was very cool. Okay. What does this really apply to Endo? Well. It's because people care why you do things. It's going back to the why. Everyone knows who Simon Sinek is, right? I think I've shown his stuff before. Yes. He makes like food, right? No. <laughs> Simon Sinek is the, he's wrote the book, The Power of Why. And this is the concept of people don't buy what you do. They, why, they buy why you do it. So it's why the example he gives is Apple. Apple is here to think differently and change the world. They just happen to make computers. Whereas a company like Dell, well, they do computers and they do this. And why do they do it? Well, to make a profit. And people care a lot more and are a lot passionate, more passionate about a company like Apple because of their why. And let's talk about what the why is of um, this company. So they want to push boundaries and ask why. Sometimes the way it's been done for years is the best way so we don't change, but other times we see things just a little bit different. And that was very much on display when we were there. So what I want to ask, and this is something you need to start thinking about, is why are you doing Endo? What, what, is it to make money? That's fine if that's the case, but try to figure this out now while you have some time and it will make the 
much easier when you start your practice. So mine, I think you've all seen this one before, is we redefine endodontics because the definition of endo is that terrible, oh, it sucks, root canals are you know, the worst things ever. We use modern techniques in psychology to create amazing experiences. And my staff knows this. And this, I had come up with this back in the like 2019-ish around that time. And I think the reason that the restaurant stuck with me so much is because what they do is they create those amazing experiences. So let's go to the TV show, The Bear. If you haven't seen it, it's on Hulu. It's fantastic. And it follows this gentleman right here, which is Carmi, who is a professional chef who worked in all these fav famous, famous, fancy restaurants and then had to come back to Chicago to cover for his failing brother or his brother's uh, failing restaurant. OK, so there's the premise of it. There's a lot of lessons that come through there. And these are lessons I hope that will resonate with you. I know you aren't in this process right now, but you will be soon. The first one, which was very hard for me, is change is hard and it's going to take time for your staff or your new staff to accept it. It will be met with resistance. No matter where you are, when you go, when you guys leave here and you start your practice, you are going to be probably changing something. I worked for my first, oh gosh, five years with a fantastic uh, endodontist, Jared Buck. He and I are very, very similar in our outcomes and how we do things and how you know, we care about patients and all the, all the good stuff. So we're about as close as two people can be as far as root canals. And the staff hated switching between us because, quote, you guys do everything differently. <laughs> so it doesn't matter if you're going in with a friend or if you're, you know, whatever it may be, every time you go into a new practice and start a new career, it's going to be this all over again of there's going to be resistance to it. And that's because they're used to doing things a certain way. For example, some of them have never put a rubber dam on. Some of them love putting rubber dams on. Some of them have never put a temporary inside a tooth. And so you need to accept that people do not like change. It's going to take time for them to embrace it as well. And one advice I can give you is if you're going into a practice and you think it's going to be a long-term fit, avoid changing too much. Um, this is my buddy, Adam. You'll notice Megan from earlier. That's his uh, new associate. And Adam's a fantastic uh, orthodontist in town. He took over the practice from his dad back in like 2012. And his dad gave him a good piece of advice when he first started, which says, for the first year, try not to change anything. Just come in learn the people, because this is going to be his practice forever. He said, if you come in here and try to start changing everything, the staff isn't going to really react well to that. And that leads me to my second point, which is that respect is earned. I respect all of you for going through dental school, for going through endo, for doing all the crazy stuff that you have to do. And that is inherent. However, your staff, they're not going to just give you respect right out of the blue. So how many of you have seen this TV show, Scrubs? Anybody? All right. Just there is a great scene that always stuck with me. Um, the this is Carla and Elliot. Elliot's the one in the white coat. She is the doctor here, and Carla's the nurse. And in this scene, when you first start off, your staff is probably going to know how to do things better than you in certain aspects. They're going to be better at X-rays, better at knowing the local the community. And there is this weird shift that happens, and this is one of the po plot points in the show where you will start to know more and do things better than the staff. And it's a weird transition period and how you handle it is very important. So with this, you need to prove yourself to others before you're gonna be able to win them over. So I still clean the toilet if something goes wrong. I still help out on the basic stuff, but the staff sees that and that increases their respect for you. They're not gonna just respect you right away because you have some letters after your name. So you need to show through actions that you've earned the privilege of leading the team. It is not a certainty that you are going to be the leader. I know plenty of offices where the general dentist or the endodontist is not the leader. It's the office manager. I can think of multiple ones in my head right now. <laughs> so if you want to be the leader of your team, and I hope all of you do, realize you need to earn it pretty much. One thing, and this is actually pointed out by my staff, it is a lot harder for females. Uh, generally, assistants, hygienists, the support staff are usually going to be female dominated. And when I've worked in offices with females, it's sometimes disappointing to see how much harder it is for the staff to accept female dentists. Uh, I worked at a big group practice and the male dentist could do no wrong and the female dentist got no respect whatsoever. So just be prepared that this might be going on for you. One thing my Jenny, my uh, office manager pointed out, which is 
it depends on the age of the staff. Why uh, We were talking about this yesterday when I was running through the presentation with them. And she pointed out that, yes, at the one office, the 65-year-old, she didn't want anything to do with these you know, 25-year-old dentists coming out of school and walked all over them. However, the staff members that were you know, 22, they respected the, the um, female doctors immediately. So if you are starting your own practice, obviously you can't discriminate based on age. I would never suggest that because that's a lawsuit waiting to happen. You might want to consider uh, trying to work with some younger staff members because it's probably going to be an easier transition for you. All right. Role number three is know your role. In a kitchen, there are roles from the executive chef to the chef to cuisine to sous chef, and you pretty much stay within that. You have to, sometimes, however, you do have to feel flexible to move back and forth into different areas, and I'll talk about that in just a second. This leads me to the concept of standard work. Do you all, do you all know what standard work is? Yes, no, okay. It's a concept in business and standard work is your current best practice for performing a task. And what you kind of have to do is look at all the tasks you have to perform throughout the day. So let's say it's taking a PA, all right? First thing is you have to define the standard. So a, a good PA is, you know, the tooth in question is centered. You have one teeth on either side. You can see the coronal aspect, two millimeters apical. There's no cone cuts. We all know what the standard is. The next thing is you have to share this with your team. The number of endodontists I know who just bitch and moan about their staff not being able to take x-rays, but don't do anything about it or don't tell them where the problem is, it's unfortunately a little bit sad. <laughs> but you need to let them know what the standard is, show them how to do that, and train them. As far as where you want it to be, make it reasonable, but aim high. So for example, our goal is that the pre-op and post-operative x-ray are about as close in image and how they look as possible. Now, it's not reasonable for me to say you should be able to superimpose them on top of each other, but I think it's reasonable to say we should make them be able to look like they the first one did as well. There's three elements to standard work. So the sequence, which is, all right, you need to turn the computer on, you need to have the system running, you need to have the x-ray unit up, you need to have the XCP, whatever it may be. There are the inventory, so are you using a positioning device, are you using tabs, are you freehand it, how are you getting that actual x-ray, and then rate, which in the business world is based on customer de demand, but I think of it as how long do I give my staff to take an x-ray, so they know that from the time we are done with paperwork, to the time that they should have a cone beam PA bite wing in the history should be five minutes. So that's the goal and that's how much turn there is. This is important for you when you start your practice and it doesn't matter if you are the owner, if you're an associate, whatever it may be, you need to be the one to train your staff. Do not expect that you're just going to go into a practice and have the staff ready to go. <laughs> if you wanna be the leader and have things done the way you want, you need to make sure you share this with your team. All right. so. Standardization in kitchens is make sure you cut everything the same way. Here's how we chop an onion. Here's how we prepare the steak, whatever it may be. Standardization in endo is make sure the x-ray is centered and blah, everything I just said. So this applies to multiple things. How do we collect information on the phone? How do you do an access? What's the room setup look like? And these are things that seem small, but when you start to think about them, they make your life a billion times easier. Imagine if every time you walked into the room, it was set up the exact same way. So all you had to do is reach and know exactly where it is. That's totally possible. You just need to train your staff to do it. Um, with that, another thing to kind of think about here, and this is uh, probably a little bit obtuse for all of you right now because you haven't really been you know, working, is to know how much you cost per hour. And this helps you figure out what you should delegate and what you should do. So in Endo, if you work four days a week, if let's say eight hours a day and you take a normal amount of vacation, it's about 1,500 hours that you spend doing root canals per year. So Take your income, divide it by 1500. So if you make you know, $300,000, you make um, $200 an hour. If you make 450, you make 300, you kind of get the idea. Then look at what your staff makes. So, and look at all the things that go on in a practice. So for example, everybody can take x-rays. And if your front desk can't, I would recommend training them. It's very useful, or at least teach them how to do a comb beam. Um, I took an x-ray yesterday, I'll probably take an x-ray today. So there are still times that I have to do it, but in general, it's better for me to be doing stuff like root canals than answering the phone. So the root canal is the only one that really drives the practice as far as from a profitability standpoint. And me answering the phone is probably going to be a lot worse. If it takes 15 minutes for me to 
go through and collect all the information, that just cost me $75 of potential work that I could be doing, whereas I could pay someone to do it, and it's only going to cost seven bucks instead. Does that make sense to everybody? It's really hard for all of us to delegate because we're all so type A. We care about those tenths of millimeters and super small things like that. But it's very important to learn. And right now, I know you guys have uh, maybe what? One assistant downstairs? <laughs> maybe two? <laughs> for you and Perio? Is that still the ratio? We got like, I would say four to five, five to six. Oh. But like they're, they're, just, they're turning over our operatories. We're not assisting. Yeah. yeah, you're not assisting. This is why it's stuff so to think not. about when you first get out. Because you're, and that's part of the problem is you're not really trained how to use assistance properly. Um, and when you get out, you're kind of at the, like, when Jenny and I started, we were both like just blind leading the blind, had no idea really how to actually do it. So this is all stuff that we've come up because of us not knowing. Okay. So make sure you learn how to delegate, but do not forget how to do it. So I still technically know how to take a comb beam. I haven't taken a comb beam ever at this office. <laughs> um, lesson four from this, how you do one thing is how you do everything. So this was a post on Instagram a while ago, and it made a lot of professional chefs angry. Does anyone know why? It's not, it's nothing about the waffle or the pancakes has to do with the tapes. Okay. It's the tape. Yep. In a professional kitchen, you don't rip the tape, you cut the tape. Because how you do one thing is how you do everything. So think of all the things you do on a daily basis. And how can we make it just a little bit better? Because a 1% improvement across 30 things you do is a huge improvement in the patient experience and in how you do your root canals. So for your staff, how's that first phone call go? How do they discuss finances? What does the office look like? Is it clean? We have a handheld or cordless vacuum and I'll, I will sleep the floor if there's junk on the floor. Because if they walk in and see that your bathroom's dirty or that there's junk on the floor, what are they going to think that means about the way that you do your root canal? If you're accepting that there's dirt on the floor, are they accepting that? Are you also accepting that there's going to be dirt in their root canal? Um, how do they do their paperwork? How do the radiographs go? How does the history look like? And then on your side, how do you talk to the patients? How do you give anesthesia? How do you operate the case? How do you document all of it? How do you communicate with the staff? How do you communicate? There's so many little things. And this is something that you can kind of, you know, as you're driving home, think about how could I make X, Y, and Z 1% better? And you will start to find that these things compound on top of each other and the benefits are absolutely huge. Okay. And yes, I do cut my tape when I cook at home. <laughs> and yes, I do also render out duck fat. Okay. Lesson number five is be human. There's a scene in the uh, show where this is the pastry chef here and he messed something up and he apologizes and says, I'm sorry, it won't happen again. And the chef says this. And he says, I won't, I won't do it again. Yeah, you will. Not because you're you, because shit happens. And that hap is so, so, so true in the office. Here's just a mistakes that my staff has made. Uh, yesterday, we've made uh, at least two of these, put the rubber dam on the wrong tooth and comb beam on the wrong side. Thankfully, I caught it. We talk about it. We talk about what we can do to prevent it. But many, many, many more. And the thing to remember is this applies to you too. We, I am my own harshest critic by far. I hate 95% of the root canals that I do for stupid little things that nobody else is ever going to see. And you need to learn to forgive yourself and to forgive your staff. We are humans and we work on humans. If you didn't want to do this, go be an engineer and work on numbers because numbers don't have feelings. <laughs> uh, not sure if you've seen Ted Lasso. He has a line of be a goldfish. That is factually incorrect because goldfish do have memories much longer than the 30 seconds or 15 seconds, or whatever it is. But the idea here, forgive, move on, learn from the experience and grow. All right. I know all of you are saying this right now. What the hell does this have to do with endo? Why are you just showing off that you went to a fancy restaurant? Like what the hell? So going back to your why and why we're doing this is because um, I think it was Sarah actually who requested, how do we communicate with referring offices? And on that same note, I added in, how do we communicate with um, patients? So we'll start off with the applications to patients. Does everyone, does anyone here know the difference between empathy and sympathy? Yes, no? No, okay. I can't see, your, your screen is like this, this, this big right now, so I cannot see head shaking or anything like that. <laughs> Uh, you guys are really, really tiny out there. Okay. Um, does anyone know who Brene Brown is? Maybe. Did I just lose my camera? 
I did just lose my camera. Cool. That's fine. She makes, she makes food. She makes food. No, none of these are chefs, guys. <laughs> 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 Renee Brown is a um, amazing psychologist who has written many, many books, and she does a lot of work on shame. And she has a great TED talk that explains the difference between empathy and sympathy. So when you are feeling down, imagine you are at the bottom of a well. Sympathy is someone goes, comes by, looks down at you and goes, oh, that sucks, and keeps on walking. Empathy is they get down there in the well with you and say, I know what this is like. We're going to get out of this together. Does that make sense, the difference between those two? Yes. yes. Okay. So how do we apply this to patients? First off, never use shame. Don't, don't say, oh, you should have you know, brushed your teeth better. Oh, you should have flossed better. I don't think I have to tell you all this, but just don't do that in general. Okay. If they come in and say, oh, it's my fault. I should have done this. I should have done this. Don't let them should on themselves. Shut that down and say, that doesn't matter. You're here now. I'm so proud of you for walking in the door. Like I, I deal with a lot of anxious patients. And when they come in, they're like, oh, I haven't been to the dentist in so long. I'm so bad. Do this. You want to shut that down and say, you, you have made the hardest first step, which is you walked in the door. And I'm so proud of you for doing that. It, it knocks them into a different mindset for sure. How many of you have had a root canal done? Any of you? All right, we have one. We need to have one of you uh, uh, do a <laughs> start a. Um, trying to see if I get my video going. No, did it run out of battery? I don't know. Anyway, uh, you got to do one. Um, I've had a root canal on number seven, and it was a great experience because not only did it make me want to go into endo, it also taught me a lot about. I was anxious for that procedure, and so. If you've had it done, talk about it. If not, talk about a recent patient of, oh, I just had a patient the other day who was just like you, X, Y, and Z, and here's how we got through it together. So that's the way you can empathize with them by using another patient. You need to be accommodating to their needs. So we have a bunch of pillows, a bunch of blankets, everything you can think of to help make them feel more comfortable um, and always be adapting. So if all of a sudden they start fidgeting or if they need suction, you wanna change that up, make sure you meet their needs when they're in the moment. Um, the other thing is pay attention. Uh, oftentimes you want to watch the eyes or the hands. Those are usually when you're going to see the anxiety come out. And the example I always like to use was from when we were at Alenia. So my wife is left-handed. And after the first course, they started serving her differently. And she goes, how, wh wh why are you serving me differently? And our server said, oh, because you're left-handed. And she's like, how did you know that? And the server goes, Vanessa, give me a harder question. I was <laughs> like, how do you know my name? <laughs> so it's little things like that. How can you surprise the patient and provide that level of service that's completely next level? So other things you can do for them. If they're having a problem, if they're anxious, bring them back on Halcyon. It you, doesn't matter if you lose that appointment. It's much better to have them have a great experience than you try to push something forward and make it worse. Be accommodating financially. As things are a little bit tough right now, you want to, when you're going to be in this practice, for those of you who own your own, you'll have a lot more control over this, but accept payment plans, accept care credit, make it easy for patients to give you money. Another great one to make them feel incredibly heard is talk about how the general dentist went over the case with you. And this is a, one of my buddies from dental school, uh, Dr. Brooks, and you should see how much more relaxed they are when they hear that, oh, someone has already taken the time to give me, focus on me. Um, remove friction from referrals. I'll go into that a little bit later and do what you say you will do. If you're going to say, hey, um, you know, I, I'm going to send a referral over to the oral surgeon, make sure you send a referral to the oral surgeon. If you're going to refer them to someone, if you're going to call their dentist, if you're going to call them the next day, make sure you do what you say you will do. Teach your team to act this way as well, and it will be tons of reward. Uh, it will be amazing for you. <laughs> um, this is a fantastic book that I, you know, you know those books where you you finish reading them and you want to start all over again. That's what this one was for me, and it's not a book that I would think any of you have heard of, but it is. It tells the story of Eleven Madison Park, um, which is an amazing. Uh, restaurant in New York City and how they took it from kind of a struggling restaurant to the best restaurant in the world. 
And the way they did it was by this concept of unreasonable hospitality. And so if you've seen the bear in the second season, when they run out and get the deep dish, that's actually based off of this uh, a story from this book. In the book, the story that they tell is these people were in New York City and they, the server overheard them say how they, you know, this was their last stop and then they were flying back home and they really wished that they could have a New York City hot dog. That's the one thing they wish they had. And so what they did is they ran outside. Oh my God, the color on that is terrible. Um, <laughs> that's really bad. <laughs> there we go. We're back. Okay, cool. Um, sorry. <laughs> I just had to change the battery on my camera. Um, and what he did is he went outside to the hot dog stand and made it look all pretty and blew these people's minds and delivered it by saying, you know, we overheard you and we would hate to, for you to have any regrets about our, uh, the food in our beautiful city. And small little things like that. How can you do those small little things for our patients and for the referring docs? And that's what we'll get to in just a second to make their lives that much better. Okay, applications to referrals. This is what you all came here for. How many of you were general dentists? I mean, I know we were all, we were all general dentists, but how many of you practiced as general dentists beforehand? There's a few of you. Okay, this is good. This makes the empathy a lot easier. So for those of you who were not general dentists, their lives are a lot more difficult than ours. They're in working on a patient and then they need a hygiene check next door. And then, oh, the patient, the one of the staff members dropped the model. So that's broken. So now we have to re-impress it. And by the way, there's a patient who's angry out front. And then what do you do? You give them a call and say, hey, or walk on in with lunch. Hey, is Dr. So-and-so here? I'm the new endodontist in town. That's not what you want to have as far as your experience. The other thing is when you're meeting these, especially if you see that they're stressed out, you probably want to go in and kind of be happy and all that sort of thing. I've seen <laughs> the, the, the example I like to give. It's, you know, you go in and say, hey, how things are going? And that's what the general dentist asks you. And you go, oh, I just got a new boat. I'm taking it out on the weekend. That's not what they want to hear. That's the sympathy. You want to be down in the hole with them and remember what it's like to feel overwhelmed with eight people needing your attention all within an hour. That's what I want you all to remember and bring that to the experience that you provide for your referrals. So how do I recommend you get, uh, get the best referrals in town? Step one is make their life easy. All right. That is, remember this, make their life easy. When I meet a new referral, one of the first things I say is, I will do whatever you want. If you want me to do the buildup, if you want me to whatever, my job is to make your life easy because that is our job when it comes to referrals. So make their prep easy. I'll talk about that in just a minute. Make their patients happy. One of the best pieces of advice I was ever given was to two-step every case for the first six months. Okay. The reason why is for six months, all you are sending back is patients not in pain. Don't ever fill a case if, it's, if the patient is in pain. And then after six months, if you want to try to start one-stepping cases or things like that, start experimenting. But by then, if you have like a top referral, they're probably sending two patients a week. So you've almost done 50 root canals that you have sent back pain-free. And it's the same thing. Great experience. We love Dr. Scott. Uh, tooth doesn't hurt, you know, whatever it may be. Then if you start experimenting, you have one that goes wrong. And you're like, oh, it hurts a little bit here. Their thought isn't going to be, damn it, it's that new endodontist. It's, oh, there's probably something wrong with the patient. Okay. So that's a very good piece of advice that I, I used quite effectively. Make it easy to refer. So I'll talk about this in a minute, but we accept any type of referral, fax, email, phone call, we'll drive by, whatever it is. Um, with that as well, communicate. And I'll go into this in a little bit more detail. but one, you really want to be the leader that they look up to so that it makes it very easy for them to refer to you. So let's talk about how to make their prep easy. In general, you're going to have two types of doctors. You have no restore or always restore. There are some who want me to, quote, do the difficult ones and let them do the easy ones. And I'm totally fine with that as well. For the, if you don't restore docs, remove the existing restorations. The number of times I've seen pictures online of people just accessing through amalgam and then putting a cavity inside there just drives me crazy. Take out the restorations. They're going to take it out anyway. Do it while you're in there. And for the love of God, take out all the amalgam before you put a file in there because I don't want you guys shoving a bunch of amalgam bullets down the <laughs> canal. <laughs> um, remove all the decay. I cannot, uh, when I, last week, 
I got a text from a friend of mine who's working at a corporate place and they're making her refer to this endodontist. And she got a case back that was just covered in decay and wasn't restorable. And so she had to have a really awkward conversation with the patient. And she said, is it standard of care to remove the, you know, all the decay for the endodontist? And unfortunately that is not in the standard of care, but I sent her this slide because this is one of my biggest pet peeves. When I first started, I went down to visit a friend in the Bay area and she literally said, I was asking like, Hey, what can I do to, you know, get good referrals and stuff like that. And she said, just remove all the decay, please. Like the, <laughs> you want to make their lives easy. And if they know that if the root canal is coming back from you, it's cleaned out, no restorative, they don't have to remove amalgam. They don't have to remove composite. They don't have to remove decay. They can literally remove your cavit, etch, and start building up the tooth. That makes their lives so much better. Proxy brushes are useful. I think I posted a video on YouTube recently showing how you can actually use cavit and then take the flat end of a glick and go in approximately to leave that area open. You then dispense a proxy brush and the patient can scrub it. So the gingival tissue is a lot healthier. Um, we arranged the appointment with their office. We'll actually do this with uh, like Dr. Brooks. I have a one that I did, I think I'm doing it tomorrow. I am seeing the patient first thing in the morning finishing up the root canal. So we tell the patient, all right, you'll see me at eight. You'll be done by nine. Uh, we'll, we will schedule it. So you go across town and you'll see Dr. Brooks at 11 for the crown. And oh, by the way, we also used a long acting anesthetic so that you'll stay numb because no one wants to get those shots again. Make it easy for them to see it. And the referring doctors are going to love this because you just filled their schedule with a patient who's already coming. Like, imagine if you had someone get your patients numb for you. All you had to do is walk in and start prepping. That's so much nicer. <laughs> um, learn to cut off crowns. Uh, we'll do this with a lot of those patients as well. There's a, actually the video I showed, um, it was a few weeks ago, I posted that one on removing bridges. That's what we did is I cut off the bridge, prepped everything, sent her over the exact same day for the general dentist to do the new bridge on top of there. So learn to cut off crowns. It uh, makes their lives a lot easier. And if you are not comfortable cutting off crowns, A, learn it. <laughs> but one piece of advice I can give you is have an electric hand piece. You're going to want one anyway to drill through zirconia because that's mostly, I mean, the one case I did this morning was through zirconia. And if you don't have an electric hand piece, it's absolutely terrible. So just plan that you're going to buy an electric high speed. Um, how many of you are familiar with silver diamine fluoride? A few? Good. Um, it is a great adjunct to my practice. And I use it in a way, I, <laughs> I'm friends with the local rep. And so I, I, she's like, I have no idea why you are the only endodontist who uses this because it makes so much sense. So if you have a patient who comes in and needs root canals on say three, 14, 19, you know, it's a young kid, had deep decay, you can only probably do one during that first visit. So what you can do is take SDF and rub it on the decay on the other teeth. And not only did you take care of the cold sensitivity on the first tooth that you did by doing the root canal, you fixed the cold sensitivity on the other two teeth and gave them the knowledge that you care about them enough to stop the progression of the decay. So SDF, I use that daily. It is a amazing material. If you don't have it at the uh, clinic, I would get some because it, it, it's a very, very useful tool. All right. For the docs that you restore for. Same exact things as no restore. Um, learn to pack cord and manage the gingiva. For those of you who are general dentists before and did a lot of these, you'll understand that. Um, if you haven't had uh, experience with CAD CAM stuff, that is what most of the practices are going to. And it's very important to know the techniques and materials that are used because it's going to change how you do things for them. What, how much material do you remove? What do you do as far as the buildup? That sort of thing. Um, if you haven't taken CE before, I found the spear education stuff to be very useful. I'm a study club leader and I've learned a ton from both the dentists that I work with and from those classes as well. So it's important that you know what their experience is going to be like so you can think about it and make it better. How do we make the gingiva healthier? How do we make it an easier preparation for the dentist? Because when you start to work with these docs where they know that you do the restorative and make it easy for them, they love, I've had ones tell me that if a patient is coming from me and they know I've done the restorative and it's all ready to go, they'll chop 30 minutes off the crown appointment because they know all they got to do is just do a quick buzz and take the impression. They don't have to manage the gingiva like they would if it was all bloody and you know, disgusting. Uh, when you do your buildups, use a very, very opaque material. I use Build It uh, Opacious White, and it is super, super white. And that way, it's easy for them to see the transition from the tooth to the restorative material. Remember, they don't have microscopes. Most loops that they're going to be using might max out at four. 
I think the highest I've heard of the prosthodontist that I work with got oroscoped it to make him a custom pair of eight times loops. He's very excited. <laughs> I love prosthodontists. And that is where we start. I mean, most of, most of the time I'm running about 10 times for the microscope and that's a normal thing for us. Um, learn to prep. I have a couple of my friends who I, uh, I've known for a while, I will actually do preparations for them uh, because that's what they've asked me to do. And I've packed cord, literally sent them over with the instructions, you know, take an impression. Uh, I do not do this for everybody. And not a lot of general dentists will actually want you to do this because they're very particular about how it's done. But if you have friends who want you to do it for them, hell yeah, do that. Um, how, you guys, have you done any lit review stuff on deep ma marginal elevation? Do you, no, you guys know what that is? Okay, so how that works is you as the endodontist will restore the tooth with composite. Generally, you can't do amalgam, but usually you do composite. And then you prep the tooth on composite at the gingival line. And then the dentist will put the permanent restoration, the crown, on composite, not on teeth. There's a lot of good evidence showing this is a far superior restoration to trying to put the porcelain on the actual tooth structure itself. And it generally has a better outcome than doing that in crown lengthening. So if you haven't done one of these before, um, I'll try to get a video up eventually, or I can show you guys some cases, but it's a very useful tool. And I would recommend doing it with one of your friends first and having them send you back bite wings. So when you suggest it to other patients or when you suggest it to other referring docs, you can show, hey, we've done this in the past and it works. I did it with Ben, my Brooks, the guy there. So here's an example of a case patient that came in recently. It is from the new prosthodontist in town. And of course, I love working with prosthodontists, so I want to impress him. And he came over. He's a friend of his from the Bay Area. The dude was leaving back to California after he saw Johnny for the crown prep that afternoon. So saw him in the morning. The prost saw him in the morning, started to prep away 30, uh, took out 29, did a bone graft, and then ended up exposing the pulp on 30. So he sent him right over to me. So what I did uh, to try to make the experience as best as possible is this. You saw this x-ray earlier. We did a cool truss access. We kept things nice and skinny. I prepped the tooth pretty much ready to go. I talked about how awesome it was that Johnny not only took out the tooth, but did the bone graft. And I put SDF in 31 because that tooth is either going to need a root canal or a very deep filling. And this way he doesn't have to worry about the pain in the, in the interim. So these are all small little things, those 1% improvements that when you then send the patient back to the prosthodontist, I mean, he, he straight up said like, oh my God, I can't believe you did all that. <laughs> but that makes them want to refer to you in the future. If you're the one who does these extra level things, these small little steps, that unreasonable hospitality, it makes a huge difference. Okay. Uh, we have, we got a few minutes. Let me quick finish this up. Um, a couple other things that you want to tell your patients is just, you know, if you like working with the doc, tell the patients that. You chose a fantastic doctor. We love working with him. That not only makes the patients feel amazing that, hey, I was a good, I had a good vibe for the doctor. They then go back and tell their doctor like, man, that guy loves you. <laughs> it's a great, uh, highly recommend that one as well. Um, like I said, it's so cool that he took care of that for you. Most prosthodontists don't take out teeth and do you know, grafting. That's awesome that he did that and took and got you out of pain. And if their work is beautiful, tell them like, oh my God, their work is so stupid good. Uh, definitely say these things. Okay. Are we, how much more do we have? I think. All right. Let's go ahead and stop here. I'll, it'll just be like 10 minutes next time, but um, I want to give you guys some time to get down to clinic. Do you have any questions for me about all that? I know that was a lot to throw at you. It's it's a little bit different, and I know it's not going to apply to you as much right now, but there are small things you can start doing now that will certainly make a huge difference when you get on into practice. And the more you practice it now, the better off you'll be. What do you temporarily restore with if you remove like an MOD? Mm -hmm. A cabinet. Cabinet space? Yep. I love Cabot. We, I've, I've been able to make Cabot do things that it should not do. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. Learn to use Cabot. You guys, you guys, you must use Cabot, right? Cabot and Fuji. That's how. Fuji's great. I did. I used to use a lot of Fuji, especially when I first started. The problem is, 
I had it happen a couple times where general Dennis said, didn't take an x-ray and just saw Fuji in there and thought I did a buildup. And then they did a permanent crown and cemented it on top of a tooth that was not done yet. So that's why Cavett's nice. That's why I primarily use Cavett now, but I used to use Fuji all the time. Cause you can, that thing I was talking about where you can, you know, create a gap in between the teeth and then give them a proxy brush. Fuji's amazing for that because it's a restorative material. So you can actually prep it, leave a gap there. And it's, it's amazing for that sort of thing. So you, if, if you do use it, no fault there. Just make sure you tell the patient, this is temporary. Do not let them put a crown on top of here. Um, Cause I've had and that happen a few times. We have the pink stuff. The pink stuff. Okay. Yeah. If it's a different color, that, that makes it a lot easier. Um, it, it works great for the posterior, but anteriorly, they may not want that as much. Yeah. <laughs> and then I use uh, for anterior stuff. If I need, if it is showing like a lower incisor, I'll usually do a little bit of cavit and then flow will composite on top of there. So good question. A little longer than a few minutes later. Okay, so here's where we left off last time. We were talking about how to communicate and create those amazing experiences for the general dentist. And we've kind of uh, finished with, here are a couple of the lines that I use when I'm working with some of my favorite dentists because the patients need to know that, hey, the dentist is amazing as well. And so by doing this, not only are you building up the patient of, hey, I am great taste in dentists. This guy is telling me that I, you know, he likes them. Also, they go back and tell the, referring docs that, and then the referring doc also feels good. So it seems silly. It seems like you're blowing smoke, but if you truly mean it, tell them this. It's, it makes everybody feel a lot better and you can make somebody's day with this sort of thing. All right. So there was the MB2 from today. All right. Making patients happy. So this is probably one of the most important things that you'll hopefully learn how to do. Um, if you were, I think the second years may have seen, do you guys see my um, efficiency presentation a few years ago at Endocon? Yes. Yes. Okay. These are the three questions that every patient asks every time. How long is this going to take? How much does this cost? And is it going to hurt? Okay. These are the three things that they care about. They don't care about MB2. They don't care about, did you finish it to a 17 or a 20 or a 35 or whatever? They don't care about, you know, they do care if it looks nice, but pretty much these are the three things that they care about. I have separate hour lectures on each one of these questions. <laughs> if, you, if you guys want me to go into more detail, I can easily put them in and talk about how we can make things more efficient so that they're not stuck in the chair for that, you know, for three hours. Like we, we shouldn't ever have to have a three hour root canal. Um, just break it up. Don't, don't, don't do that to yourself or the patient. Um, I have a great, uh, presentation that's probably going to be more for when you guys are out in the real world, but how much does this cost? Having an accurate assessment of how much the patient portion is going to be, especially if you're going into an insurance environment is very, very important because that's pretty much the number one complaint that we have at this office is insurance didn't cover what you estimated. And we try to take all these steps to prevent that. And even still the insurance can just kind of do willy nilly, whatever they want. And then the final one is, is this going to hurt? Um, talking about pain control and anesthesia. I don't, would you guys want to see that for the second years? Would you want to see that lecture again? Or should I wait until you guys have graduated and give it to the next year? Uh, it doesn't that. matter. Doesn't matter? Yeah. Okay, think about it. I think I've gone through all the topics that you requested, Sarah. So I'm, I'm kind of trying to see what else you guys would like to do. I can always make, make something up. But um, if you think of something, let me know. I can always put together a presentation on it. Okay. Send patients back with zero pain. One of the best recommendations I can give you that I was given when I first started is to never fill a tooth that is symptomatic for the first six months. So literally all the cases I did for my first six months were two steps. And it was annoying, obviously, <laughs> um, but it gave you more time to figure out, you know, if you were scheduling an hour and a half and all of a sudden you realize it only takes you X amount of time to open up a case. Well, we can maybe shorten the appointments or let's work on more things with the assistants or it, it, it's a nice way to ease into private practice because it is going to be a transition for all of you. If you've talked to any of the recent graduates, it is hard. The, the, the volumes more, the cases tend to be more difficult. The patients tend to be more difficult. And then you have to deal with all the other stuff that you don't really deal in residency. So this is one way you can just kind of take a little bit of control of the first six months. All I'm going to do is two steps. And then what that allows you to do then is send back patients with zero pain. So when the, they go back for the crown, the filling, whatever it may be, the general dentist is used to hearing, yeah, nothing hurts. Tooth feels great. And so then after that six month mark, you can look into maybe, okay, this one I think I can do in one visit, or let's do this one in one visit. And then if for whatever reason there is pain coming back, you have built up this case log that you've been sending to these dentists of 
great, 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 great. And now all of a sudden, patients like, oh, this hurts a little bit. Well, you've now said, hey, all I do is send back patients who aren't in pain. And if one comes in, they're more going to be likely to blame the patient rather than you. So it's another way to make sure that the, especially when you are first starting off and starting to get your name out there, think of how great it would be if you could make your name and what you're associated with of painless root canals and patients who are happy. Like that right there, everybody wants to work with that guy or gal. The other thing is to make referrals easy. So here are the different ways we get referrals. We can get them via text. You can fax us. You can email us. You can call us on the phone. You can call it. You can chat with us. You can go through the website or you can even come in in person. And we have probably one of these every single day. What you want to do is meet people where they want to communicate with you. So for example, I had a dentist last night call, text me after hours saying, hey, I have a patient in pain. What's your availability? I got the patient's information and we called the patient this morning. They're going to be our emergency patient today. The fax and email all go into the email. Phone calls, obviously, are probably our number one way we get them. We get a few from our Facebook and Instagram pages. We'll get some from the website. And we will even have some patients who are they're just like, ah, I'm on my day off. I came in here. Can I do paperwork now and get it all taken care of? Make it easy to get patients into your door. The other thing is to communicate and you need to kind of communicate in the style that works best for both the referring doctor and the patient. So this is from a study looking at how the different generations like to communicate. And you can see in general, millennials, the younger generation, um, and this definitely is with Gen Z as well, are going to be more likely to use something like a social media or perhaps text messages. Everybody likes face-to-face. -face. <laughs> That's kind of, uh, you know, it's, it's hard to... You know, you can pick up on context clues and things like that with face-to-face, -face. but you'll notice that the older generation may prefer emails or they may prefer phone calls and kind of Gen X is in, in between. They're just kind of, you know, I think they're called the forgotten generation for that reason. Um, so you want to kind of meet them. And this, this works with dentists too. So for example, I got a text message yesterday from a dentist, took care of that. One of my most favorite dentists to work with is a uh, older guy in about two hours away, never actually met him in person. And he's a fantastic dentist, but he likes to call. So I just make time to call them on the phone. So you'll find that depending on the community that you go into, you're going to have to communicate with both the patients and the referring doctors in the way that they would most likely to be communicated with. Which, which way do you guys want to, if you were to go to, you know, say you have a dermatologist appointment, which, how would you like to be communicated with? Email. Email? Anybody else? Phone call or email. Text message. Text message. I'm with you, Johnny. I, I just want just text me. Don't yeah. don't call me. Don't don't email me. Yeah, if you ever email me, I might not get back to you for a while. And it's just because um, my current inbox, if you want to know how much of a monster I am, I have about 3000 unread emails in the one and about 20,000 in the other. So I'm not very good at checking my email. <laughs> but texting probably much better. <laughs> What'd you say? You're a celebrity. Who are you? Oh, I just get random. Uh, <laughs> just It's mostly just stuff. That you usually go to a website once and then you're on their mailing list for the rest of the time, even if you cancel yeah. it a thousand times. Yeah, it's mostly that garbage. So. All right. Yeah. As I was saying, this applies to doctors too. So when you first go into a new community, depending on where you may be going, um, ask them how they want to be communicated with. I, 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 I've often said being a specialist is like you're dating 50 people all at once and they all have different preferences. And so... One of the things you can do, like literally when I first went out there, I would get the name of the front desk, any kids, any information. I would get the preferred way of communication, phone numbers, emails, whatever it may be. And we made like this little dossier of, okay, so for Dr. Smith, he likes phone calls. His front desk is Shelly. She has two kids and she's really into fishing. And what that then allows you to do is personalize it just that little bit more. So when we call over to Dr. Smith's office and Shelly answers the phone, hey, Shelly, are you going out and getting any trout right now? I heard they're biting well. Okay. There's a lot of fish people, men, women in this area, <laughs> if you can't tell. <laughs> so same thing. Oh, you know what? I have his personal cell phone number. I'll give him a, I'll shoot him a text to call me after work so he doesn't have to worry about it. You want to meet the people where they most want to be met. All right, this is another example of this. I'm not sure if you saw this video. This is one where a patient came in and the cone beam looked really funky and weird. I'll go into it more in the lecture I'm about to give. But what I did is quick recorded a the cone beam and I recorded the uh, uh, consultation and kind of the videos. And then I just made a quick voiceover saying, hey, 
this is what I'm seeing. This is why I'm concerned about it. And I sent it to both the general dentist and the oral surgeon I was sending him to, to get evaluated. And what that allows you to do, that's way better than a one sheet email of, Hey, something's weird. You take a look. So for things that are a little bit more extreme or different, kind of think outside of the box. I know a lot of endodontists in larger areas will actually use FaceTime for post-op um, information with different docs. Some people like that. So th there's, there's tons of technology. Use it to your advantage. Here's another example. This is a doc that I had been working with on and off. Um, I've, I've been trying, he's literally a mile away from me and great guy. I just could not really get any patients in. And so what you'll see is he's saying, Hey, I need some help. I got a patient. My associate did it. That associate's gone. I don't retreat cases. We never actually build things out. Could you just retreat it? And he says, I'll pick up the fee difference. And so my response is, of course. And what you want to do is get you don't need to ask anything else by this, okay? You, you know that a, it's a retreat on number 30. Just ask for the patient's name and phone number. And you can see he gave it. And then he's done. He doesn't have to do anything else. He can talk to his front desk. What you have to do, though, is make sure that you then communicate this. So this is a chat message where I took a screenshot and sent this to Jenny and my other front desk saying, hey, get this taken care of. Let me know what his portion is. We can probably write it off. He took care of one of our other patients. So make it a thank you and make this thing, make it so that there's no um, phone tag. We don't want it to be, oh, you know, Dr. John told the patient, hey, they're going to take care of you. Patient calls. I haven't told the front desk that. And they're like, no, you still owe money. Like, you, you, you know, you, you're going to have your copay. You want to make sure that you do what you're going to say you're going to do and make sure that the communication is very, very clear, that there's no ambiguity. They completely understand we are going to just bill the insurance. We'll, you know, write off the amount that the general dentist was offering to pay because we're going to help them out and everybody gets a good day out of it. This kind of leads to the idea of you want to make sure that expectations meet the reality. When they don't, that's where we have discord and issues with patients and the other staff. And yes, I did end up seeing him. He's in Castle Madrasa right now. Weird, weird case. If you look at those mesials, they are somehow flared at the apex. And it was gutta percha in there. I thought it may have been calcium hydroxide, but it was gutta percha. Here's what it looks like as far as the calcium hydroxide shot. So um it was gnarly. Uh, it, it was, I want to be surprised. We're actually going to lead into that right after this about how to deal with these large infections, but we'll be seeing him back here shortly and hopefully have the finished uh, image for you guys too. A couple okay. final things that I recommend when you're starting off a practice, be a leader. Yeah, yeah, go for it. Can't you not write off the insurance for the patient portion? I'm going to bleep that out for YouTube, but yes. Yeah. <laughs> I'm yes. going to, I'm going to bill the dentist and never collect on it. <laughs> okay, got <you>. Yes. <laughs> you are correct. I don't even think his, we're not even contracted with it. You can do whatever the hell you want if you're not contracted with the insurance and I don't think we are on his. So it's fine. It's okay. only you, you can if you are fee for service and have no agreements with any insurance, you can do whatever the hell you want. You can just take the insurance, you can just take the copay, you can make them pay you out of pocket. But if you are contracted with the insurance, you do have to charge the patient and they have to be they have to pay their portion. So Thank good. You. Thanks for catching me there. <laughs> All right. As I was saying, um, yeah, final recommendations when you go into whatever practice you're going to, you want to be a leader. You want to be seen as a leader in the community. So get involved. I think a lot of you know that I'm involved at the ADA level and it's been fantastic. Not only do I really enjoy it, I've met a lot of referring doctors that I wouldn't have normally and they started to send because they see you getting involved and they see you being a leader. And it's really easy then to say, oh, I'm going to go ahead and send patients to them because they're also a leader in this. Lecture. It is one of the best things you can do. This is me looking very sweaty a few years ago at uh, the San Endo, <laughs> at Endocon. Um, but it's one of the most rewarding things you can do. A, you can pick and choose the cases to be only the ones that are the greatest. You don't have to show any of your bad cases. You don't have to show any of the, oh, we didn't quite get the fill. Pick and choose and make them perfect. And when you lecture, you immediately have authority. You are the one talking to everybody else. Um, it, it is one of the best things you can do. Pro tip, talk to, it may be anxious and, you know, anxiety inducing to go and talk to a bunch of dentists, but it's really great to go talk to hygienists. So I would recommend that all of you, when you get to a new area, 
find out the local hygiene association and see if you can come give a lecture on whatever. They tend to like trauma. Trauma was a cool one. They really liked resorption. Um, I also gave one on SDF. They were really confused. They wanted me to talk about SDF. So I gave a lecture on SDF, but it, and just be prepared for a lot of referrals to come after. <laughs> as soon as, I mean, the after I gave the trauma, I swear to God, I saw a, a trauma case a week for the next month because that's all I kept sending you. <laughs> um, but really, really good way to get your name out there quickly and establish yourself as a leader. Okay. Final thing here is referral strategy. This is actually the question that Sarah had, I think. And here we are, 94 slides into 99, and I'm finally getting to answer the question. Um, and the answer is, you kind of just have to roll with it. Um, everyone is familiar with the 80-20 rule. Yeah. It's well known in whatever, the business, 80% of your profits come from 20% of your you know, patients, whatever it may be. And in general, that's going to be the same thing. 80% of your patients are going to come from 20% of your docs. Okay. Well, I actually did an interesting thing and looked at the ranking of last year and this year. And what you'll notice is we had some big jumps. We had a 20 to one, we had a 30 to six. We also had a seven to 14 or an eight to 20. We had new docs come in. We had some move up, some move down. And so what I can tell you is the only thing that is constant is that change is going to occur. So the way that all the, if I could summarize all the lectures I've ever gone to on referral strategy, Focus on your top, you know, for ended on us, let's say top five, five or six. Okay. Those are going to be your core bread and butter. If you look, there's not much movement there. Three went to two, six went to three, one went to four, four went to five, two went to seven, et cetera. So keep those happy, take them out to dinner, whatever you like to do, but also have those reach goals, have the, Hey, let's get this 30 and turn them into a six. Let's get this 20 and make her our number one. You want to still have these reach goals and make sure that your team knows this. Okay, if a patient's coming from Dr. Flynn, we're getting them in right now because she's a mile away and I want to see all of her patients. That's the 20 to one, by the way. So you want to have those reach goals, but also focus on your core group. So like I said, focus on your top 20%, but have your reach goals. Okay. Concluding this presentation, finally, you want to figure out your unique why in endo. Why are you doing this? What's going to set you apart? Why do patients want to come see you rather than someone else? You want to then use that why, that purpose, to create unreasonable hospitality. I highly recommend reading the book. I know you guys aren't reading at all. You have nothing going. You have tons of free time in residency. But it is a good book um, if you're interested in that sort of thing. Or... Chicago's not that far away. Just go to Alenia and you'll get the whole service. It'll be fun. <laughs> um, for patient applications, you want to use empathy. Remember we talked last time about sympathy versus empathy. Pay attention to them. Create that special environment. Be accommodating to them. For referral applications, you want to do all those same things, but also make their lives easy. Um, and then as far as referrals, focus on the majority of your time on that top 20%, but change is the only constant. Okay. Any questions on that one? That good? Yes. Yay.